So, we have quite a good lineup for you guys tonight. So before we get going, I would like to say that my name is not Luke Melia. My name is Chris Lopresto. I do work for Yap Labs. Luke's pants had a wedding to attend in L.A. and could not be here tonight. So on with the show. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Pivotal Labs, wherever they are. There's a little bit of a ghost town vibe uh, tonight. And uh, they provide this great space. They provide uh, pizza usually. I think in lieu of that today, uh, we have some SoCo over there if anyone wants to dip into that. <laughs> <laughs> But we, but we, we would like to thank them and, and Luke's cousin, or no, sorry, Luke's brother-in-law, Micah Young, works here, and it's obviously a great place to work. So anyone interested should sort of get in touch. We'd also like to thank our other sponsors, Movable Inc., Simple Reach, for their ongoing support and host of our project nights. So, the next one of those, Jorge tells me, is on Monday, October fifth, at the. Neo office. That's going to be on lists in Ember. So that's the next thing to look out for. And while we're on that topic, the next big one, our schedule is like the third-ish Thursday of each month, I think. It, uh, so the next one is going to be Thursday, October 22nd, right back here, hopefully with some pizza for you guys. So I should also mention thank you to Yap Labs, where I work, along with Ray, Chris Selden, Luke. We are a consultancy based here in New York and obviously out in Seattle with uh, Chris usually on video with us each day. We do Ember-based projects, and if you are interested, come talk to either Ray or me here later or at the bar afterwards. We're going to be headed out to our usual place, the Crooked Knife. It's on 14th Street. Uh, once we finish with all of these fine speakers, we'll put info in the Ember.js Slack and all of that, and uh, we'll kind of go over in droves. It's a really good opportunity to kind of uh, talk with colleagues in a different atmosphere. All right. So... First up, we're going to have Sam Selikoff talk about the latest version of Ember Modal Dialogues. Sam works at TED Talks. They use some Ember stuff there. He's, uh, he also has a background in economics, so I'm trying to think of some good questions to ask him at the bar. He has written Ember CLI Mirage, which I'm sure all of you use, and TED uses the, the latest version of Ember Modal Dialog, which has some changes in it, and they have some really neat stuff that he's going to show you. So here you go, Sam. Thank you. Hey everyone. Um, yeah, so this is this is just going to be really quick presentation. But I found um, Ember Modal Dialog to be super useful, um, not only for things you you kind of traditionally think of as useful for modals, but for things like drop downs, tool tips, and um, in one of my projects at work, I made something like similar to an action sheet from uh, from iOS development. So I'm just going to kind of run through some of the changes and um, show you what what those look like. So um, so the first main change, if you're if you're kind of upgrading, if you're new and you've never used this before, I definitely encourage you to check this add-on out. It's really easy to use. Um, the big win with using modal dialog over a different kind of add-on for modals or other things where you need to render something that's kind of in a different place from where it, the rest of the context is, is that you get to pretend like you're kind of where the rest of the context is, but then modal dialog uses this library called uh, wormhole to basically let you render it anywhere else, right? But you don't have to do a bunch of wiring to get the data that you already have into your modal dialog or into your tooltip. So that's kind of the big win with using Ember modal dialog. Um, and so now I'll just run through some of the changes. Well, one of the first changes is modal dialog is, is now nested. So this, com this main component that we use, there's kind of a container, overlays container, that's rendered as part of rendering your modal dialog. And initially there was a sibling next to the actual dialog that you rendered. And so, um, this was one of the, when I started using it, one of my use cases was I wanted to achieve something like what the Trello dialog, uh, how it functions, how it behaves, and that's on the left. So if you have a large modal that's rendered, um, you can't maybe quite make it up, but basically you can put your mouse over the modal and scroll and it'll work. But then you can also move your mouse kind of to the overlay and scroll and it'll work. And then you see the scroll bar here. And I think especially this kind of behavior on, on a mobile, like on a tablet or an iPhone, 
it feels much more natural. Whereas initially when you have it as a sibling, because the overlay was rendered as a sibling so that you could click on it and escape the modal, but then the actual modal itself was kind of this narrow element. And so you can see on the right, that was my initial version of the app I was working on. And you could only scroll if you put the mouse over the modal itself. Um, but then, you know, users would expect, especially if you're on a big screen and your modal dialog is like max width 300 pixels or something, you can't scroll it if it's kind of overflowing. And so this kind of solves this. Now that modal dialog is, a, is a kind of nested within the overlay, it behaves just as you would expect. And so here's kind of the, the latest version of the app. And you can move your mouse over and it kind of just works as you would expect. Um, so that's one main change. And then I guess the next, the last main change is initially some of the updates started adding this concept of being tethered. And so it started to be clear that modal dialog was useful for more than just kind of your standard modal. Um, it was useful for things like tool tips, um, popovers. And so they introduced this library tether and it was initially just a setting, a config option on the initial modal dialog, but now there's two components, modal dialog and tether dialog. And so um, if you're using an older version and you want to kind of just bump up to the latest version of modal dialog, basically this is the main refactoring. So this is the idea of tether is kind of expressed here. You can imagine the yellow box is kind of the element that you want to tether to, like a button, let's say. Let's say you want to have a button, you would click on it click on it and then have it drop down with some options. So the drop down would be your your dialogue, your tether dialogue. So the concept is you specify a point of attachment on the thing you're attaching to and then on the thing that you're actually, the dialogue component that you're rendering. So this little red um, box would be the point of attachment. So initially, this was just how you specified it with modal dialogue. You give it a CSS selector in alignment target and then you say, okay, I want my dialog to bind to the bottom left of this thing, and then I want it to bind the top left of my element to the bottom left of my target. And so now that we basically have tether dialog um, as the is the component that you use when you want to actually tether. And so that's basically the only refactoring right there. We're just changing alignment target to target, alignment to target attachment, and this is to keep in line with the syntax that's used by the actual tether, the underlying tether library. So this is nice because now you can just, if you want kind of more control over the positioning, you can just go to the tether library and it's going to be the same API. You can just plug it in right there. Um, so that's basically it and that is, it makes for a really nice um, usage of the library because this was kind of the action sheet component I talked about earlier. And I use this other add-on called Ember Responsive, which, which just tells you whether or not you're kind of in mobile or desktop. You just get if mobile dot, or if media dot is mobile is true or not. And so if we're on media, I basically use the modal dialog full screen component. Um, again, it has the nested rendering, so it dismisses when you tap. But then you can have that kind of nice UI for on the mobile, it's easier to tap with your with your thumb. But then when you go to desktop, we use a tether version, and then you can just see it's kind of like a, a dialogue, and I can just show it to you here. I have it up. Um, so this is just a prototype of, of the app that, that I'm working on. And so here's an example of kind of the nested dialogue. We have some more here. Um, that's a big window. If you have a small window, it kind of works just as you'd expect. Um, and then the action sheet, which just you know, the template is very simple. If it's mobile, render a modal dialog. If it's uh, else, render a, a, a tethered dialog. So we can click here, and then you can see that's the actual thing. And, and you can do anything you want from this. You can, you know, go to a file picker or send an action out, um, all the kind of normal things you'd expect. And again, if you haven't used the library, all those actions are in the context right there. So if you're on a component, you can handle it right there in the component. You can handle it in the route. You don't have to wire anything together. It's all right there. And so it's getting the data for this thing from the same spot um, that it is getting all this other data. So um, yeah, that's basically it. Again, you should check it out. It's a great library. And um, thanks a lot. Thank you, Sam. Does, I, I, we've talked about Ember Modal Dialog a, a bit before. Um, does anyone have any questions for Sam about the way they're using it? Sure. Here, Sam, I'll give you this. Check, 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 check. Oh, hello, hello. Uh oh. Uh oh. You
tool tips. Um, in one app, I have I do have some, but I think it's from a while ago, and I was using some of like the Bootstrap versions. And I think this is a great way to just kind of rip all that stuff out and you know write JavaScript because inevi inevitably what happens is you you use something from the Bootstrap JavaScript library or whatever framework you might be using, and then you need to do more stuff. And so I think it's better to just start out with something like this. I mean, this modal dialog gives you the primitive you need to do any sort of. Now I'm using it for drop down, you know, like a just just a menu item, but just make it a modal dialog because it's so easy. And and you know, if you need it to do some sort of crazy action or anything, you're gonna have the same API as just normal links and buttons in the rest of your app. And so just if you just make it a a component, it just makes it easier. Um, so yeah, tooltips you can use it for tooltips. And, and again, like the the positioning makes it really easy to do that with Tether. So. Yep, exactly. Yep, for tooltip, for drop down, you use tether modal. And again, it's really easy to do. Like, I don't even remember what the, you know, there's some, the bootstrap API for making it left align or right align. Let's say if your menu is on the top right of your, like, title bar and you want the drop down menu to be, you know, the top right of it to be aligned with the bottom right of the button, now you have to add a class. And so if you want to change that based on something, you have to do class binding. Whereas this, you just, you have the attachment property as a property on the component, and it can just be middle right, middle left, center, bottom, whatever you want it to be. So yeah. Exactly, reposition the scroll, window resize event, and it just keeps it intact. So yeah, it's really, really nice. All right, any other questions for? Oh, I see one over here. Does it work with Ember 2.0? Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, here, I'll grab this. If, uh, uh, and Paul, you can start setting up while we chat more about this. Uh, I haven't looked right now. There, we have the Ember Tri Matrix, which should go. Uh, there's a chance it might be failing on Canary, but it should be good through 2.0. I think 2.1. Um, we'd have to check. But there's nothing in it that, that that should not work. It's all public APIs. And I guess the one other thing that I should mention is that if you're using the Tether dialog component that comes in the add-on, that makes use of Ember Tether as a separate add-on. So you would install that separately. We don't carry that dependency directly, but if you install that, you'll be, you'll be good to go. And Ember Tether wraps HubSpot Tether, so all of the repositioning, all of that logic, yeah, if you are, are interested in, in seeing how it works or what all the different options are, there's really extensive documentation on HubSpot's Tether project pages and GitHub pages and all that. All right, I think we will move right along. Sam uh, recently moved to New York City, so uh, chat with him at the bar after, make him feel welcome like a proper New Yorker. And we're going to move on to Paul Stefan Ort here. He's going to... I love that, that we have a talk called Crashing on Autopilot when we're going to be flying drones later in the, in the night here. I, I won't give it away, but, um, but I think, Paul, you recently moved here as well, right? From Texas, is that correct? From Oklahoma. Um, but you presented this talk at, at Lone Star Ruby or something to that effect. And I'll just let you take it away. Do you want the Brittany mic? Or do you want the mic? Oh, this will work. All right, cool. All right. Thank you. I'd like to start with a story. It was 2002, which some of you might remember as the year of desktop Linux. There was the future of native UIs, well, not native, but cross-platform UIs with Swing, and Java was extremely popular for desktop apps. During this period of time, I began to explore open source software and was very excited about beginning to use the Mandrake Linux distribution, and over time, I explored different applications, like image editing tools and various libraries. It was not just an interest in open source. It was a corresponding rise in a vehement dislike for anything coming from a certain closed source software company in Redmond. It was so intense that I would avoid sources just because they had something to do with Microsoft. And over time, I learned that this was a terrible mistake. Because in my quest for reading only things about open source development, I had missed one of the most important books about software development. It was only after many 
people told me about the lessons of Code Complete that I finally read that resource. Now, years later, I began to learn about cognitive biases. So I may have learned about, I may have outgrown that adolescent passion against Microsoft. But the problem of that scenario of self-selecting ignorance because of commitment to a set of resources was something I had to learn more about later. As software developers, we're dealing with complex systems and designing tools for managing information. And as we manage complexity, one of the useful tools that we have at our disposal is simplifying things. Unfortunately, when we simplify things, sometimes we take mental shortcuts that have unintended consequences. In the case of choosing ignorance, I had manifested selection bias where I was surrounding myself with only resources that I thought would be worthwhile instead of broadening my exposure to resources that um, would potentially have unexpected lessons. In simplifying things, one of the useful tools that we have is design patterns. We can have reusable structures and shared vocabularies for thinking about different ways to solve problems. This lends itself to both increased collaboration through, um, through minimized rework and removing the need to independently discover established ways to do things, but it can also be misleading. Having a familiarity with object relational mappers, I know that when I create a new object using the mapper and save it, it will create a SQL statement to save or to update or insert a record. So something like this should be fairly straightforward. Now I'm sure many of you have experienced this. We go and look at the actual model and see that it's a little less clear what's happening. Something that usually should be, or that is understood to be a model save operation triggering a SQL statement has a host of unrelated responsibilities. This sort of implementation causes the reasoning that one might have about what a model does to be invalid. In this case, we might have shared vocabulary, but without digging into details, that shared vocabulary can't have shared understanding. In cases like that, it may be better to use something that doesn't have a shared understanding, but at least points to that uniqueness and forces one to look at the details to understand what's happening. That's a manifestation of the availability heuristic, where we tend to interpret things by what we already know, sometimes to detrimental results. Perhaps a more common or more public problem in our industry is the appeal to novelty. Sometimes problems are mischaracterized, where a problem of understanding or implementation is assumed to be a problem of the oldness or newness of a particular technology. This appeal to novelty can be exciting, but it can cause one to answer the wrong question, replacing the difficult question of, are we using something correctly, with the question, are we using the latest, newest tool? Another bias that I have to struggle to strive to overcome in my work is that of overconfidence. As we explore various tools and develop familiarity with different technologies, it's very easy to get to hello world in many different tools. The problem is, the things we might discover in a couple of hours of exploration tend to be far simpler than the challenges we'll encounter even in a simple two-week project. So what can we do to think about cognitive biases and address them effectively? The first thing is to be mindful of when we are engaging in these mental shortcuts, recognizing common areas of misunderstanding. And as we recognize these, these inclinations in ourselves, we can anticipate when others might uh, be tempted to misunderstand 
say, a piece of code that looks like it follows a certain pattern but actually doesn't. And understanding this, we can address the underlying problem of having a shared vocabulary without shared understanding and of presuming too much about what we know and what we don't. Thank you. All right, thank you, Paul. Cognitive biases, yeah. We, we face them all in every project. Does it get any easier? Does it ever get any easier? Is there hope? This is, you know, more metaphysical. I don't think I have the, the experience to give a, a definitive answer on that. I think we find new things and hopefully become better. Fair enough. Spoken like a true software engineer. Does anyone have a, so I guess while we talk about questions, Isaac, would you mind coming up and, and setting up? Uh, does anyone have any questions for Paul Gorov? All right. Uh, hey, so I'm wondering what particular cognitive biases we as Ember developers might have. Uh, I don't know. Check, 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 check. Hello, hello, hello. All right, let's get that microphone back. Where is that one? Cognitive biases that uh, we Ember developers might face. I would, I would personally say that uh, one of Ember's big things is that there, there are no uni unique snowflakes. We are not unique snowflakes. So I mean, I don't know if that's an anti cognitive bias, or I, I just, we're going to need someone more qualified than me to answer, but um, software in general, I think engineers, we try to train ourselves just to be aware that, that, they, that they even exist, that we have blind spots. Do you have anything you might add? So, not necessarily technology, technology specific, but having a set of tools makes one inclined to use them. And when I was first learning about MVC, for example, I began to think of every problem in terms of a particular MVC implementation. So even I thought I was being effective by thinking how things could be implemented, but in many cases I was really short-circuiting the process of thinking about the actual requirements and going directly to this requirement for a certain story means we need this controller, this model, and this this flow of operations. So the, the danger of assuming or rushing too quickly. Um, for, um, having a hammer and thinking everything is a nail. That's actually a very good answer and very apropos for Ember, because there are probably plenty of, I don't know, let's say an add-on that you just use in, in every project that might shift out from under you over time. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> All right, moving right along, we are going to hear from Isaac Ezer here. Isaac works with Matthew Beal and Corey at 201 Created now. He's also a jazz pianist and swing dancer. Right. And Thank you. there's YouTube footage of him jumping off of this bridge. It's absolutely terrifying. I suggest you ask him about that. But in the meantime, we're going to hear him talk about our, our future controllerless world. Thank you very much. It's here for Isaac. Thanks, Chris. Can you guys hear me OK? Is the mic working? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Cool. As Chris said, my name's Isaac. I work for 201 Created. And I want to talk about creating reusable components, reusable code. Uh, this is not a, only a thing we just always want to do, but it's going to make us, uh, it's going to make it a lot easier to get rid of controllers when we eventually want to do that. So what I did is I built this kind of simplish app that uh, it's just like a, there's a, we have a user model with first and last names. So far I've implemented this index page that lists a couple users, Louis Armstrong, Miles Davis. I've also implemented a new route, which is just a simple form where you could create a new, uh, a new user. But I'm not really happy with how I did the new route, uh, so I'm going to refactor it to make it really easy to reuse for editing a user. And in the meantime, I'm going to move some things that are currently in the controller out into a component, which will make it really easy at the end to reuse it. Whoa, where's my editor? 
It's my first live coding experiment, so please uh, be supportive. So this is what I have for a route. Uh, this is the new route. So we're user slash new. We create a new model uh, using store.create record. And then over here in the template, we basically have a form uh, which is going to call a save user action when the user submits. We have two input tags where you can enter the first and last name. Uh, and then this uh, save user action is implemented on a controller. So I have a new controller. And what, what it does is it takes the model, calls save on it. If it works, transitions to the index so we can see what we've created. And if it doesn't, then it shows an error. So I've seen this type of thing a lot, and I'm sure I've written code like this before. But there's a couple of things I don't like about it. The main thing is I don't like this model.create record. So I see this type of thing a lot. And what happens is if the save doesn't work, this model stays in the store unless you remember to clean it up. So it's going to show up in the index, which is really annoying, you know, and it won't be saved. You won't know why it's there. And maybe data will linger from a, a, a uh, previous use. So I've written some tests. And I have a failing test called uh, can exit new route without saving, which I'm skipping. So let me uh, bring that test back. And then we can see what's happening there. Test. And I have a debugger. So if we go run that test, hopefully we can see what the state of the world is. Oh, hold on. Get the container. Here we go. So you can see, I'll show you the code for the test in a minute. But Louis Armstrong was the, uh, the second record that we were trying to create. You can see it doesn't have an ID. Thelonious Monk has an ID because that was in the database. Uh, so it's still lingering, even, uh, even though we went back to the index without saving. So I'll show you this code here. So what we basically do is we visit new, we fill in a couple of things, but then rather than clicking submit, we click the index link. And we expect that the old one was there, the first name, but the new first name is not there. So like I said, what I want to do today is implement editing, and I also want to fix this bug. So I'm going to implement these other uh, tests. I want to make sure my error handling works, all that good stuff. So again, this was the new route that I had at the beginning. And I've already created an empty form, a component called a user form. So all that code is going to go into here. Oops. Oh, no. <laughs> Let me try that again. There we go. OK, so and then this template. All I need to do is a user form, and I'm going to pass it an action, save user. So I really like these templates uh, where there's just one line, and it's a component, because I know there's no functionality in a controller that I'm going to have to move later. So that's, uh, that's something I try to do as often as I can. So there's a couple changes I'm going to make. What happened to my, here we go. I'm going to get rid of this model. So again, I, oh, I don't know if I talked about this. Uh, in this new route, yeah, I really don't like this. I did talk about why I don't like this stuff, so we're going to get rid of that. We're going to get rid of the model. This component, uh, user form. So I've created a really simple action here. First name and last name, from the perspective of the component, they're not going to be part of a model. They're just going to be strings that we bind to the text field. We're going to pass it up to an action. And that action is going to know how to update the user, save it to the database. Uh, I really think it's what happens with a big app where you have like saves and create records and components all over the place becomes really hard to maintain. Because if you want to do one thing, if you want to do like one new step before you save your model, you have to grep for all of those instances where you've done it. It's just a lot harder to reason about. So I like this pattern. I would even put all these things in a service or at some top level route. So we're going to call this function save user. So now we need a function. So we had this save user action in the controller. And what we want to do is get rid of that and move it to the route. So I have the new route. And there's a couple changes I need to make. We're not calling transition to route. We're calling transition to. And let's see what happens. So ideally, right now, our test should pass. Our uh, test related to creating should pass. Oh, a, there is an issue. So this model, we don't have this model anymore. So we actually have to create the model. So we're going to say this dot store dot create record user. And then the other thing is that component, if you recall, passes us a payload. So we're going to use the payload. And this is a nice pattern because in this action, we can do some security on the payload. We can limit like what kind of properties we actually want to send to the database. Let me get rid of this doc. Uh, 
let's see. So our create new user is still passing, which is awesome, but I broke error creation. So let's see what's going on there. So in the new, in the user form, I have this error message, but it's clearly not getting bound to, from the controller to the component. So I just have to add it here. Error message equals error message. And the other thing I have to do, I can't set it on the route here, I have to set it on the controller. So this dot controller dot set. This is like a little bleh, like I'm gonna have to go refactor these when we get rid of controllers, but I don't mind it so much because it's easy to search for. I know all these places in the route where I call this dot controller, I'm gonna refactor to use like the routable component or whatever. So let's see, great. So the error message, error handling is now working. Uh, and that bug with the exiting is also working. So now I'm gonna try to implement updating. And hopefully if I did made this component in a nice reusable way, it's gonna be super easy. So I have an edit form which currently does nothing. And I'm gonna paste that in. And there's one extra thing I wanna do. In the case of editing, we have a model. Oops. So I'm gonna pass the model to the component. And we're trying to preserve a data down actions up paradigm here. So the component's not gonna change anything on the model. We're getting away from binding that uh, text field directly to the property on the model. I see some heads nodding. We're just gonna pass it down for the purpose of populating the data. So let me show you the test that I'm working on. Uh, so update. So one thing I always like to do when I'm testing uh, an edit form is make sure that the state of the world when I start is how I want it to be. So in particular, all the inputs are pre-populated with the current data. So here we visit uh, slash users, which is the index. We click a link called edits. And by the way, expect element is, uh, I'm using an add-on called Ember CLI acceptance test helpers, uh, which we work on at 201 created. So that has some useful helpers for acceptance tests. So expect element will tell us if this thing's on the page. It is, we can click on it. We get to the user route. So now, I look for those two inputs, which this is currently failing because they're not there, and then I assert that the values are the correct. So let's see what's going on so far. If I rerun just the update test. So three of them passed, and then at this point where we're looking for that value, uh, it's not working. And that's pretty easy to fix. The reason is first and last name are always null. So what we want to do is we know a model's coming in that's null. We're gonna make the first name, ember.computed.reads, because we don't want it to change the model. And last, yes, yes. So that should be enough to fix that part of the test. So we have a couple more pass, passes. Okay, we don't, we don't have this button update, so now I'm gonna go set that up. Right now we have just the string submit. So if I go back to the user form, I'm gonna make a little computed property. Button text, ember.computed, it's a function. Return this.get model, question mark, update, colon, uh, create. And I'll use that here. So this is a general uh, pattern when basically refactoring comes down to separating the things that change from the things that remain the same. So you look at some code you want to reuse and you think like, what are the, the, the couple of areas where we're gonna need to change some stuff? And look at that, it passes. <coughs> yes. Thank you. Um, one last thing I want to show, uh, sh trying to get in the habit of using more helpers. So I already created a little helper, like submit button here. So I thought this button text thing would be a nice place for a helper. Uh, so I could do submit button model and I can go get rid of my button text. So I think this type of thing where you're making computer properties just for some <coughs> string that's gonna be different than shown on the page, I wanna start getting away from that. So I wanna encourage you guys, uh, you know, looking at this code, where was that helper? It's pretty easy to start writing helpers, so I encourage you to do that. So that is my talk. I made a few notes on some summaries. So when you have route templates where that template just has the one component, you know you feel good. You know you're gonna be able to refactor that easily when you wanna get rid of controllers. Uh, ideally, components aren't doing too much with the API that you can do in like a route or a service. As the app gets bigger, I think that'll get a lot, help, a lot easier to manage. Use helpers. Start thinking about reuse early in the development phase. You know, you wanna move from a situation where you do this type of refactoring to right away you just decide, let's make a component for this thing because I'm probably gonna reuse it. 
Uh, and lastly, these were two helpers. Uh, these are two add-ons that we work on at 201 created that I find really helpful for testing. I'll show you the other one quickly. It's just uh, for stubbing. Here we go. So you could stub, you, you pass in your method and like the URL, and then you could assert some things about the request and then return some data. So it's basically a wrapper on Pretender that's a little more expressive that we like to use for testing. So uh, thank you very much. That's my talk. All right, thank you, Isaac. Does anyone have any questions for Isaac? Yeah. All right. Why do you put click handler inside of and then? Uh, inside of it? Yeah. Uh, usually because I want it to happen a after some other stuff's happened. Uh, so for example, let's see. Because other yeah, otherwise it's going to run like it's immediately when you call visit. So the page might not be fully rendered. So and then make sure all the run loops, all the promises have completed before you start doing like whatever you want to do next. So anytime I expect something on the page to change or a potential API call to happen, I have an and then from one step to the next. But they're also asynchronous yeah. Pardon me? They're also Click is asynchronous. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah. OK. So in this case, it, so in this, in this particular case, you could have the Actually, I guess all of them fill in. Click all, all of those helpers right, listed there are actually themselves async, so they would they would be okay outside of the end. Then, oh, fair enough. I guess I get in the habit of this because eventually there's going to be something that is not async that I just want to be wrapped. It helps me just think about the flow of what the order of which I think things will happen. Any other questions? All right, let me run this mic over. Were there two hands or one? All right, I'll start with Henry. Uh, thanks. I thought that was a great live coding. Oh, uh, thank you. Very good job. Uh, what is this? Is an Ember question, more of a Vim. But what's the equal and plus on the in your gutter that kept toggling when you were equal writing? and plus on the left? Oh, that's uh, like stuff's changed in in just files changed based on what's in GitHub. So it's just showing me like diffs parts of the code that have changed since so my last commit. It's Emacs, by the way. Yeah. So that's a, that's a git diff. And shout ongoing. out to Adolfo for giving me some good recommendations of stuff to use. <laughs> that can wait for the bar, that discussion. I didn't even use, I have some funky uh, snippets. Just want to show off a little. Here goes. Anyway. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, just cur can you pull up. Sorry, guys. Could, I, could you pull up the, like the route that handles the create action? Yep. Right, so you get the payload. So what I found is like if you have a lot of like nested components, yep. it gets kind of you end up with like a lot of middlemen who yeah, just that's kind true. Of pass up the, the payload. Yep. Have you run into that? And if so, like what do you do about that? Um, I have run into that. Usually I try to get avoid more than like two or three levels of testing, so it is a bit annoying. I think there's probably some ways you could use like kebab actions to get get around that, but I haven't messed around with that too much. That might be a good place for like something on the controller just to take it up to the route. Uh, you know, that might make it easier to pass through. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Uh, so, uh, what uh, I read a blog post recently about um, you could uh, use the read-only helper to make the components more reusable for when they were going to be turned into angle back bracket components. Right. And I was wondering what your opinion is on that. Um, I think using one-way bindings is definitely good. Like, you, there's occasionally some fun stuff that comes up where you want to use two-way bindings, but uh, you know, I basically used it here. This is just a one-way binding, so I know it's not going to. It's not going to break when I'm forced to do that. Um, yeah. One thing I've done on some other projects, like you can, if you're passing an action to a component, the action could just call mute and change a, change a uh, property. So that's a nice, like, concise way to do kind of a two-way binding, but it's still easier to reason about because the component is still causing an action to uh, update that property, but it's not really too verbose. So, yeah, in general, I like data down actions up. Any other questions? All right, thanks, guys. Hello, hello. All right, thank you, Isaac. Okay, so we are 
really hoping to be flying some drones around the room here tonight. Uh, and Andre over there is doing his best to get things that were once connected reconnected. So we're going to shuffle up the lineup a little bit here. We're going to take a quick break right now uh, while Taras gets set up. So, okay, guys, if you want to sort of find your seats, we're about ready to start back up. And we wanted to open the floor to anyone who has announcements. I know that there is at least one. So, Hassan, if you want to uh, come grab a microphone. And anyone else who has an announcement, uh, it's, it's about sit-down microphone time. I'll go kind of quiet. Hey, everyone. So, uh, as you probably know, I'm from uh, Monograph. And we are actually on the verge of shipping. And we're actually having a big, huge party. And so everyone here is all invited to our party. It's going to be at the New Museum on Monday at 7.30. That's uh, in the Lower East Side on 235 Bowery. You can go to monograph.com slash release party, all one word, and RSVP. And I hope I can see everyone that's here there, because it's going to be awesome. So... So to recap, Monday, party, open bar, monograph. I don't know if you said blockchain, but I'm going to go ahead and say blockchain. Blockchain. Okay, does anyone else have any announcements they'd like to make, whether it's hiring or side projects that you're running or just general technical musings? Now would be the time. Otherwise, forever hold your peace. We'll talk at the bar afterwards. Once again, that's going to be the, the Crooked Knife at 14th Street. So, Taras, Ember Sherpa, here to talk for the third time at Ember N- N- NYC. <laughs> you all know him, so I'll just hand it to him. Here you go. Um, oh, hi. Hi. Uh, I actually, I'm going to make an announcement beforehand. So, um, okay. So, we have a um, global Ember meetup uh, next event on Saturday, and Gorov is going to be speaking about uh, inside Ember Twiddle. And it's an online event. So it's at noon. I hear people like put it on their big screen and just watch it like while sipping coffee at home. Like it's apparently really good for that. So you're welcome to join us. Um, I will tweet out later a link to uh, to this thing. So it's gonna be awesome, and Gorov is gonna kill it. So, all right. Huh? Okay, I will. Yeah. Um, okay. So this talk is going to be. So it's not going to be about glimmer, which might be disappointing. It's going to be about things that glimmer. And like uh, Zara's engagement ring. (laughs) 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 All right, no, so it's actually (laughs) actually going to be about about things that shipped with glimmer. So a little bit walk down the memory lane. Uh, These two fabulous individuals uh, announced uh, glimmer at EmberConf in March. And uh, it was a glimmer of hope for uh, performance in Ember applications. It was really rad and fast and awesome. And then uh, uh, Yehuda uh, shipped this PR with uh, a description of how Glimmer is going to work and how it's going to borrow a bunch of awesome things from React and uh, how the hooks are going to map to React's hooks and uh, all kind of goodness. And then, bam, we've got this. uh, uh, They they shipped it on June 12th, as promised. Um, and um, so I want to talk about, but actually the thing is that we didn't actually get exactly what we thought we were going to get, but we also got a bunch of things that we didn't, know, we didn't think we were going to get or didn't know we were going to get. So I want to talk about the things that we didn't know we were going to get. And uh, one of those things is closure actions. And closure actions is, um, uh, there's, a p- uh, there's an RFC uh, that uh, Matthew Beal wrote up that describes how this thing works, but basically what it does is it um, it allows you to wrap uh, your action from your controller uh, into a closure and then pass it as data into a component. And it unlocks a lot of really cool things. Um, and those are things that I'm going to talk about. <coughs> so we're all very familiar with this. This is a input helper, and it allows us to show an input field. And uh, for those who start learning Ember, and they saw this. Somebody, you know, p- people who knew like HTML before they wrote any Ember code, they might be like, well, why do we have to do that? Uh, well, the, re- the, the fact is that making, uh, showing an input field that actually works is actually, was pretty complicated in Ember pre-Glimmer. It did a lot of stuff like, uh, you know, if, you, if you're two-way binding updates, the data, like if you enter, input, uh, enter something into the input field, 
the data had to be sent back up the uh, two-way binding, so there was some code that handled, uh, you know, handled that mechanism. Um, and there's all kinds of other stuff that's built into the input helper. Um, and the result of this, like this abstraction that we needed to use to be able to do simple things like input helpers, oh sorry, uh, yeah, like rendering input fields, is that um, composing uh, components using input fields was actually not as simple as it could be. Um, it's something that should be really trivial because it's like the, the most fundamental uh, primitive of uh, building a web application was actually really complicated. And uh, so one of the things that uh, Glimmer unlocked with uh, uh, closure actions is the ability for us to use uh, to use regular HTML and write templates that look like regular HTML and then just work as we would expect as opposed to as some per, per some rule of how the component um, or how the helper was designed to enable you that functionality. So what you see here is not a um, it's not a um, uh, angle bracket. Uh, helper, input helper, it's a regular input helper. It's a regular input helper that uh, that says it's going to be a type text and we're going to bind the title to the value. Um, and uh, so if the title changes in your state, it's going to automatically update the, the input field. And the thing that we see at the bottom there is we're, what we're doing is this is uh, the action, um, closure actions in action. So <laughs> what they do is it, uh, it will take the update title from the context, so from the controller, we'll take that update title uh, action, and it will wrap it in the closure, and then it will assign, uh, uh, bind it to that on input helper. So when you write something into the input field, what it will do is it will just do what, uh, what, what the DOM does. When you enter something in, it will trigger that on input event, and it will trigger that function, and then it will uh, send the value to the uh, update title action. So what we have now is we went from uh, a helper that did a lot of stuff to a primitive that does exactly what you see. And th what this does, it actually allows us to build much more, um, much more elaborate experiences without having to jump through hoops. Um, so we don't have to do this, although it looks really fun. Um, so one thing, we have to have cute little pictures of moving things, otherwise uh, we're gonna get bored, so there we go. Um, and so what we could do is we could take it up one notch, so we have, uh, we have the same code up top as we saw in the previous slide, uh, and then uh, at, at the bottom we have that we're using this mutable title helper, oh sorry, mutable, uh, the, the, the mute helper, which will apply the, um, the value that it receives onto the title property. So we're basically, uh, we are creating a, uh, an action that we're passing into the, the action helper and then that's being wrapped in the closure and then that gets triggered when the input happens. And so what this does is it, it, does, it um, gives us the same kind of functionality that we had with the input helper where, you, where it's kind of s simulating the two-way binding, well, it's giving you the, the two-way binding uh, mechanics. Um, and um, so, this is cool, but I mean, this is just input helper, right? This is not that that miraculous, but um, this is pretty awesome. So, what we have at the top there is a, a view select. So we, we we are rendering a um, select view. So, aside from the fact that the view helper is deprecated, um, this was actually what we had to do if we wanted to show a select input field, and the problem with this is that. If you wanted to do something other than what's built into Ember, this was actually really complicated. And um, and for doing some some really basic things that um, that we wanted to do, we had to jump through a lot of hoops again to be able to accomplish uh, uh, accomplish our goal. And we all know that designers give us things that look good, but they don't always map onto um, map onto the HTML or the functionality that Ember provides us. So having to rely on that is really complicated. It's really difficult. It makes our life really hard. And so to be able to scrap that and replace it with what looks like HTML and what functions like HTML um, is great because we can now just use the same things that we know about working with input fields, but we could use it on, on a select tag. 
So what we have here is um, we're going to start off at the top. We have unchanged. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to set the selection, pro uh, selection property in the context. And then we're going to iterate over a list of options. And we're going to bind the, um, the value to each option. And then we're going to have this select property. And what we're going to do is we're going to use a helper that comes with Ember Truth helpers. And we're going to uh, evaluate and then use the result of that, and we're going to bind it to the selected to, to, to select the property. And what that's what, what that's going to do is when uh, when the selection changes, that thing is going to be reevaluated, and the and the the state of selected is going to be updated automatically. And so we basically have a fully functional select input tag, uh, but we don't have to jump through any hoops. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, who thinks it's awesome? Because I think this is awesome, and okay, all right, good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm not the only one. <laughs> good. Um, so, okay, so then we can go on to other things that are cool, like radio buttons. Um, I didn't show an example of how to do a radio button because I've never implemented a radio button with Ember, so I've never had to do that in two and a half years. So I don't actually know what that's like, but I can imagine what that's like. Um, if we follow any patterns that we. Yeah, yeah. Well, there 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 are add-ons that could give you that, but again, it's could jumping through the same hoops. And so, what we could do is use the same primitives that we that we saw earlier, and we're going to build a a, a, um, a radio input uh, field. So, we're going to iterate over a list of options, and we're going to uh, bind to value, and then we're going to unclick, to mutate the selection. And we're going to bind to checked and do the same thing as we saw with, uh, with, select, uh, with select tag. And we're back at in functional without any of the craziness. OK. And now checkboxes. Checkboxes are awesome. Checkboxes are awesome because if you want to know if a person knows how to work with Ember, like 1x, you should ask them to implement a checkbox. Because that is complicated. And depending on how far you started, like if you started in the beginning, you would have to do something like array computed item co uh, with an item controller, and then like all kinds of stuff. Um, if you did it a little bit later, you get to do um, you could do oh sorry uh, yeah so you could do array computed and then do like a object proxy and all kinds of stuff like that. So it's it you have to know you have to know a lot of things about how Ember works and how Ember's engineering works to be able to implement what should be really simple. And with um, with Glimmer and closure actions, it actually is simple. This is what we're using exactly the same primitives, um, you know, iterating over a list of things. We're going to bind to the on click. One thing that's different here is that instead of, um, instead of mutating the property, we're going to call the update selection action, which is going to, um, which is going to push the value into an array. Because usually like, we have checkboxes. We want the user to be able to select multiple things. So we need, them, we need the user to be able to uh, push the value that they selected or remove the value that they selected from a list of s uh, from uh, an array of selections and and um, and then to handle to check if the thing is checked or not um, I created this array contains helper which uh, is available on Ember add-ons and it's available as an add-on and what it does is it takes um, an array as a first argument and the value is a second argument and it will just evaluate to whether or not that thing is inside of that array and so again, we're using the same primitives to implement another next HTML element. And so this is really awesome because we can then like that this this primitive is so effective because we can then take it to the next level, which is let's say we have like ten thousand checkboxes, which you could just do the same thing as we did before, but then you have like ten thousand elements and we don't want that. What you would do is you'd use Ember Collections, which allows us to um, only display a number of elements that the user can actually see. And so we're using exactly the same primitive. So what you see in the bottom is uh, inside of the block is exactly the same. In the Ember collections, uh, we're going to pass in the options. We're going to specify how these um, items should look inside of the collection, uh, inside of that the container. And uh, our Ember collections becomes our iterator, or the iterator. And um, and so we do this, which is the same thing as we saw earlier. And then we get this, which is essentially 10,000 items rendered. Um, this is a video of it, so it's not as actually it's not as uh, responsive as it could be. But so essentially, what we get is we have the ability to uh, to scroll through 10,000 items and then select select things, and then it just works. And we did nothing except just switch each with Ember Collections. Okay. So, do you guys have questions so far? 
before I go on to the next thing? Questions? I want to ask questions now because, um, no, okay. So, um, so there's a bunch of things in Closure Actions RFC that were that was implemented and that we got, and I'm glad that we actually do in th that this slide comes after your your talk because this is actually applicable directly to what you were saying. So what we have here is one of the benefit of being able to treat uh, the action as data is that once you pass it into the component, you can then use that and you can execute that function and I inside of your component and you and one thing that uh, that closure actions do that our previous actions didn't do is give us a return value. So what we're doing here is um, we have a form that allows us to um, edit the uh, the post. And what I'm doing is I'm passing uh, a closure action into the save pro uh, argument. And we could see what the save does in the controller. It uh, returns a promise uh, once the, well, it returns a promise of posting that thing, sending that thing to the post endpoint. And so inside of our component, uh, if we look on the, on the left there, the or your right, yes, uh, the post form is going to, inside of the component, we have an action. And what's going to happen is um, when the user clicks save, we're going to do the things that we want to do, usually with the component, which is we want to show like a loading spinner. So we're going to set is loading to true. And then we're going to get the post data that we want to uh, that we want to save, and then the next line, the adder save thing. What it, what that does is it it goes to the adder's hash, adder's hash, and takes the um, the uh, save action, the closure that we sent in, and we're going to basically call it as a function, and we're going to pass to it the data that we want to save. It's going to go into our controller. Um, the closure is going to execute the code in the from the controller, and it's going to return a promise. And in our component, we're handling the promise. And what that does is it allows us to um, to separate the logic uh, that is related to presenting the results of that action from what is actually happening when you when you when you click that save. And this um, this to me is one of the one of the biggest wins for um, for this particular RFC. Uh, is the fact that we can make our components composable and allow us, uh, it allows us to leave the logic of how the data is persisted outside of the component, and but then allow the component to actually handle what happens when uh, we get an error or what happens when the, when some other thing happens. Um, how is this? Questions about this? Yeah. Uh, you will get. You'll only get the stuff that you pass into it. So what you could do is uh, you could pass. Uh, so if after save you were to pass additional arguments, it would uh, it would include those. And so if one of those properties changed, uh, it would be within the context. Yeah. So it it still respects the the context rules of. Uh, yeah, yeah. There is, so there's other stuff that um, that this RFC provides. Oh yeah, so this is my. Uh, oh, why is he not doing? Oh, there we go. Okay, so yeah, this is how happy I am about this. Um, and uh, moving pictures again, um, but there's other stuff in this RFC, and um, it's worth looking at. There's th there's some uh, some other mechanics that I didn't talk about, like currying and stuff. That's that's really cool, and it's worth taking a look at. It's the RFC 50. Um, Number fifty. So, okay. So I'm I'm done with uh, closure actions. Yeah, go on. Can we get? And there should be a more valid before I hit the last one. Is hit the bottom button. Here you go. Uh, okay. So when you're passing, w when when you have that list, right? Um, where we're doing checkboxes, right? Um, what what are you passing into into the Ember collections call? You remember the list with the checkboxes when you said you had about a thousand, um, like the call. You're you're, you're passing it onto on, onto what uh, is it? Yeah. 
Yeah, so this is, uh, so uh, when I'm iterating over like thousands of checkboxes, I'm using the Ember collections. Uh, it's an add-on that, uh, that is the two, uh, Ember 2.0 incarnation of uh, list view. Um, it's, uh, I think it's still, it's still not, not released fully, like it's available on GitHub, but it's not, it's, uh, it's, I, I'm not sure if it's in, in Ember add-ons, but uh, the, the I wanted to show how we can use the primitives to, to build really complicated things without having to jump through hoops, that's, that was kind of the idea. But that's the future of showing a lot of things on the screen uh, with Ember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, but this is actual, this is working implementation. Yeah, so this is uh, using an actual add-on uh, and uh, uh, like it's, this is actually, this is what, w the, what, what we're gonna see in the future as we're doing these kind of things. One more question. All right, other questions, here you go. So are there any uh, relevant use cases for the input helpers in 2.0? Uh, I ask because I'm pretty new to Ember and uh, it's still in the documentation for 2.0 with the helpers, and this style of um, data binding isn't, uh, you know, explained anywhere in the core documentation. I just right. Yeah. This this is new. Um, I I don't know if uh, well, the input helper does a lot of stuff um, which I don't usually end up using. But, but the idea is that if you can do it within in the HTML template, what you can do is like if there's some functionality that you need, you could uh, well. So the real win here is when you're trying to do more complicated things. So if you're trying to do something that it that doesn't fit the the mold of uh, the input helper, um, is you, by using this you can add the functionality, wrap it into a component, and now you have a reusable piece of functionality, like a reusable component that you can that has a functionality that you want. But um, but I would say that even if you are if you're just building input, uh, if you're building forms, like you can use this technique today, uh, with the, with Ember 113 plus. That makes sense. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Any other questions for Taras? Okay. All right. So there we go. Um, so okay. So the next thing, and I think my yeah. So um, so one of the things that that w that we um, were expecting to come in when Glimmer came out, and we shouldn't expect anything because everybody's working for free and it's not fair to say that we're expecting. But I thought that, like one of the things that we thought was gonna happen is we're gonna get uh, one-way data data flow, which is what uh, what React's like thing is, like there it's one-way data flow. Um, but the reality is that uh, it, some things take a, really take a lot of work and um, it didn't fully ship. And also we needed to have backwards compatibility, so applications that we have today, so like basically if you, if you upgrade today uh, to Ember 113, you get the benefits of Glimmer, which is built in, so you get the speed, uh, the improvements in speed, and also you get this uh, component life hooks, um, and you get the adders hash, which uh, where the uh, the data that's coming into your component is available. Um, but it's not fully uh, it's not fully one way. So um, the current components have the same functionality, the, the same. Uh, behaviors they had in the past, which is the the attributes that are coming into a component are available on the component state as well. So um, the current, so which allows your components to work the same way with Glimmer or without Glimmer. But in the future, with Glimmer components, um, so in Ember 2.3, the attributes are not going to be copied into your component state. You're gonna have to actually copy them. So when we go, when we go get into uh, into angle brackets, the proper the data that's coming in to your component is going to be on an adder's hash. It's not going to be copied onto the state of your component. And um, so um, I want to talk a little bit about data down actions up uh, because it's important to understand why it's important. Um, and then I'll, I will talk about what we get with Glimmer for data down actions up. So in the past, so Two-way bindings is our thing. Is, it was our thing in one X, and it's going. And we're going to have it, um, especially if you continue using the mutable helper. But what the problem with so what I have here is on the left, uh, or yeah, your left. Uh, the um, the green thing is supposed to be a simple as like two-way binding. So if anywhere that you set that property, so if uh, if if, a pr if an argument is going into a component, anywhere where you set that, the property will propagate through the component, and the problem with that is that if you if you have sufficiently complicated system or sufficiently complicated like uh, structure of your components, um, or even it doesn't even need to be that complicated, it becomes really hard to understand what's actually happening. And the problem is that we have no way of we have very few ways of actually understanding what's happening to the bindings. 
And so, if you wanted to, you could add a you could you could add an observer to the to one of these computer pro to one of the um, bindings or to one of the properties, and and it would st and put a debugger and it would stop, and you could see what the value is. But I personally never found that to be very effective. It's not a very reliable way of of understanding what's going on. And so, uh, two-way bindings, uh, oh sorry, uh, data down actions up is a big improvement to that because what we have is the data is going in the same way, so data is going into the component. And the only way that you can change the data that is going into your component, you have to call an action. So the purple thing is an action that leaves your component, and then you set that property, uh, that, that binding on the context. And now what that does, what, what that allows you to do is it allows you to put breakpoints um, inside of the component that's triggering the action, or inside of the, or in the um, context's action hash or action handler. And you can actually see what's happening. You can see what data is leaving your component. You can see what data uh, is wh how the data is arriving in your context, and then you can see where explicitly see where you're setting that property onto the um, onto the binding. And this is a big improvement. So with with um, in the future when we have uh, Glimmer components, it that connection to the components is not going to be two way. It's just going to be by default. It's going to be one way. So if you do, so if you try to mutate a property that comes in, you're just not going to be able to do it. Um, you, the only way you'll be able to mutate is by sending an action up. So this is the pattern that we are moving towards. Now, one thing that's really, what's, uh, what's cool with Glimmer is that we have this one other way of being able to understand what's happening inside of our system, which is using the did receive adders hook. So this is a did receive adders hook is a, um, is a hook that's part of Glimmer. And what it does is, it, is that it, um, it is triggered every time the data is coming into your component. And it gives you an extra point, w an extra place where you could actually see what is happening when um, uh, when data outside of my component changes. You can see what data is coming in. You can put a breakpoint there, and you can actually see wh wh what's going on. So, um, so did receive adders is uh, Donald Trump of uh, of uh, Ember's uh, component lifecycle hooks because it allows you to uh, fence your attribu incoming attributes from your component state. <laughs> All right, I tried. <laughs> Basically, yeah. So, um, it, yeah. So, so one of the things that uh, one of the side effects of uh, this uh, of using did receive address hook is that you actually don't need to have the one way one way, one way binding or the one way computed, because what you see like these two pieces of code do the same thing. Um, when you uh, with with the one way uh, when the value is changed, um, the underscore value it gets that value from value, um, but if you set underscore value, it's not going to propagate to the to the value property, and um, and the same thing you get with did receive with using did receive adders hook to copy the value that's coming in into your component. The one benefit of of um, of that is that per you only need to know what did receive adders hook does. You don't need to know what one way does, and I think that um, that it's. Um, I I like primitives in this respect because you could actually, you can understand more of what's going on in the system. You don't have to understand more of what's going on in the API. Uh, and did receive address hook is useful in many different scenarios. So they're both both going to work, but I personally think that that's the preferred way for me. But uh, yeah, I, I, I would prefer to see this happen as opposed to one way just working for me magically. And uh, so to see the um, uh, data down actions up in action uh, is, well, this would be the example. So we have on did receive adders. So when the, when the value that's coming in uh, into the component changes, did receive adders will be called. We're going to get that value, and we're going to set it onto underscore value. Um, and and if we want to mutate, we, if we want to change this value, what we got to do is we got to uh, trigger an action. And my example is bad because I don't have an action handler. Uh, but uh, so basically, you, you would trigger um, when uh, when you want to update the value, you would, you'd call the update action, which would call the onChange, and uh, that should have an onChange right there. And that would actually mutate the, the uh, mutate the pro the value that's coming into the component. You guys have any questions about this so far? Questions? Yeah. Small one. Um, what does it call it? 
dash case for on change for the action handler. I'm really curious, is there like a convention for naming actions that's different to variables? Because I've seen, uh, you know, camel case and snake case and hyphen case. Uh, well, I think there's some talk about using, uh, about making that a thing. So it will actually be like, it will be part of Amber. So it will, um, which I don't know if that's wh where that is. If anybody knows, Alex, do you know what the, uh, so the question was uh, the, con the convention rather using the, uh, the uh, kab kebab case versus camel case. Um, do you know anything about uh, whether, like what the status is of that? Because I know uh, that Rob was, uh, Robert was talking about uh, yeah, so like I think right now there's nothing. I mean, I've been using that pattern to si to signify that the that that action is coming in from the outside as opposed to um, as opposed to something I define on the component. So I, I use uh, camel camel case when it's uh, internal, and it's uh, and I use kebab kab case when it's something that's passed in. That's what I've been doing. Any other questions? So one of the one of the other um, added benefits of did receive address hook is that uh, we we it allows us to see how the value is changed. So we can actually see when did receive address hook is called. We get this address um, address address proper uh, address uh, argument, which has two things on it: it has old adders and new adders. And old adders is the old, uh, contains the old values um, is a hash that contains old values, and new adders is a hash that contains new values. So when the components render the first time, you only get the new adders because there's no old adders. But you can actually, so what that does is it allows you to, you can actually see what the old value was and you can see what the new value is coming in, which is pretty awesome. And then you can actually decide, like if you're if you're copying the value onto your onto your state, then you can decide like if, if it's undefined, I don't want I don't want to mutate my local my local value, for example. You could do something like that. Um, so this value value thing is uh, uh, so this first so it's old adders. And then the property that is the argument that's being passed in, um, and then the value is where the actual value is. This is one of the things that's um, that's kind of awkward with this API, and it will probably change in the future. But I wanted to tell you about it now, so you can break your apps. Uh, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, so, oh yeah. So, any questions about this? Yeah, adders is always set. Uh, this uh, the uh, like it's not in here, but uh, yeah, the adders hash always gets set. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so there's more hooks. Um, I'm not going to talk about 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 all of them. I'm not. Gonna, I'm, I'm only going to talk about did receive adders. Um, that first one is um, actually going to be removed. So this this um, this blog post when uh, this is the uh, Amber 113 blog post an announcement blog post um, has that hook and is going to be removed. So that's not going to be a thing anymore. Um, but did receive adders is the one that I've been like, looking at most. So that's the one that I know most. The other ones I don't really know their use case as well yet. So I, I'm not going to talk about it. Um, and so one thing, like one piece of advice is that, um, so in the past we talked about observers uh, being problematic because they're synchronous. They're even more problematic when, when working with Glimmer because um, they, um, they don't respect the, uh, the lifecycle hooks. So you have another place where you, where, where, you can get the, where you can get caught. So if you have a scenario where the, uh, the observer fires and then you do something that, that leaves the component, you you can actually create a scenario where the when the, by the time that the component is re-rendered, it actually overwrites your like your properties that are coming in. So like, and bec and that and that is like I've actually had a few scenarios where it's like it's weird because um, because the observer doesn't care about the um, about lifecycle hooks. So uh, okay, so that's me, Ember Sherpa there, um, and uh, I have the Global Ember Meetup. If you guys. Um, we have some really awesome talks. Uh, I don't. I don't have internet, but we have like six talks planned for. Uh, uh, we have talks planned all the way up until the end of the year. We have two every every month, and uh, not talks, events. We have a lot of talks. One of the first, uh, one of the next ones coming up. Uh, Gaurav is going to be speaking about um, Inside Ember, and uh, Ember Twiddle, and one of the nice things about about Global Ember Meetup is that you can see people write do code stuff because like when we and it's 
during the day so we're not too tired because like I know like meetup format can be really exhausting and people keep talking. And <laughs> so um, it's, uh, and we have, we're gonna have, like we already have some videos coming out, but we're gonna have videos for everything. So um, yeah, that's it. All I'm right. Gonna, I should mention this. I forgot. Oh but yeah, go Basically, for it. it's uh, so the company that um, I am, that I run is uh, it's called Working Together. That's the acronym, and um, it uh, we provide mentoring for teams. So if you guys have, so if, if your company has uh, difficult problems you need help with, or you have um, people who need to be ramped up, we can provide that support. So. All right. Thank you, Tara. You can give him one more round of applause because that was awkward. You ready? All right. So, good news. I think that we have surmounted our technical difficulties. So that means that drones will fly. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely worth a, a round of applause. <laughs> so, Andre, do you need any help carrying stuff? You're you're all good. Okay, no, 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 you're good. Okay, so so uh, while Andre kind of comes up and makes sure he's all paired, um, who is using, yeah, get, get whatever you, you got time. Who is using Glimmer Ember 113 Plus in production? Show of hands, yeah? Okay, who, ha who aspires to, uh, like has planned it in an upcoming sprint? Some people ready to do that? Maybe? <laughs> all right. It's, uh... It's fun. It's going to be good. It's fun. Okay, so Andre has a, a, has a drone right here. It's going to fly. He is a Dre Nerdo. Is that how you pronounce it? Okay, that's, that's his handle on GitHub and Twitter. He has his own company called Sweet Folio. And he's here to make that thing move now that it's paired with his brain. So, Andre, take it away. Hopefully, we don't have the same issue from before. I think we do, hold on. It worked by me. Uh, well, let me explain the hack before I get started. Uh, what I'm using is a Roland Spider Parrot drone and a Muse headband. Uh, for the purpose of this demo, I'm gonna be using uh, the Acceleromina data from this, heads from this headset to control the drone going forward, backwards, left and right. Uh, I added EEG data so it calculates whether I wink to flip the drone, uh, clench my teeth to make it go up and down really fast. Uh, this other stuff, I don't want to hit anybody with the drone because I do have uh, past history with that. <laughs> I'm glad there's no lawsuits. <laughs> Does the front row need to back up? <laughs> I, I hope. I hope uh, Pivotal Labs has insurance. Because um, hold on, I wish I could entertain you with some jokes, but unfortunately I can't. Hold on. Is this live streaming, by the way? No. Is this okay? I hope. Um, sorry, people who are going to be watching this at home. This is going to be on YouTube, right? Damn. <laughs> Please edit this part out. <laughs> Hold on, I'm restarting my Android phone. Hold on, let me make sure this headband is. How many of you have restarted an Android phone in the last 24 hours? <laughs> All right. Are you, uh, we came across a, a bug. Um, I can't remember which Slack team. Someone was talking about um, they were using Evernote on Android, and any time they copy-pasted a note with a checkbox in it, their Android phone would reboot. <laughs> they eventually narrowed it down to that, so we all feel the pain. Okay. I'm going to keep it there just for now. All right. All right. Hopefully this works. I should have just kept the demo up. Um, hold on. All right, so what my Android app does is scan for Bluetooth. So it scans for this device, and once it goes into the once it goes into the app, I press connect. It uses uh, it finds the Muse headband, and then it just sends me a bunch of data. What I'm going to do is I'm going to press take off on this device, and then I'm just going to control it from there. Hopefully, it does not hit anybody. If it does, just swat it out the way. Um, just make sure this thing is on. Hold on. Uh, <coughs> so what I use is the Muse API, uh, the Muse SDK, and the uh, Paradrones SDK to communicate with each other over Bluetooth. Um, as I said before, this has EEG data, so I only use only two features, just Wink 
to flip the drone and just clench my teeth to just make the drone go up. And, uh, there we are. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, okay. Sorry. Sorry I bored you all. That's not even on. God damn it. Okay. There we are. Come on. There we are. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to take you. I'm sorry. So what I'm going to do, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my head this way. What the fuck? Hold on. Hold on. It's actually moving. I just don't know why it's not. Hold on. There we are. There we are. Hold on. Let's see if that feature works. No, it doesn't. So it is working. It's just very, very buggy. I'm sorry. Um, let's see if I can move move it forward. Let's see if I can move it backwards. So you see it's moving. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's what it does. Sorry. Um, I wish I had, like, a camera up here, but it's just data just being returned back to me. I'm not touching anything. I'm just moving my head forward and backwards. Um, I took out the winking feature. Let me just land the drone. Emergency. So uh, I took out the, the wink feature because that was really buggy. And the purpose of me, uh, for the purpose of the New York Tech demo, because uh, they yelled at me for making the drone go forward, um, I couldn't get that feature to work. So yeah, that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me, by the way. This had nothing to do with Ember.js. So thank you. Thank you. All right, so. Any questions? Thank you, Andre, and thank oh. you for hanging in there. That was definitely worth it. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions, any questions about what was going on there? I imagine yeah. that we might. All right, uh, here, let's run over here first. Java. All Android. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, next time I'll come here with an IoT <laughs> Ember J JS <laughs> hack. Well, it, I'm sorry. We had Ember, man. Come well, on, how dare you? I it's an it's an Android app that yeah. you wrote, right? Yeah. Yeah. So so there you go, Java. Uh. Well, this headband doesn't work like that. You have to give it certain bits of data. Like, for example, if you're winking your eye, that's th that's data that the headband can that that that's data that the headband can collect. This headband is not like any uh, like a uh, open BC open BCI or any other brainwave sensor that's out there. It only picks up certain bits of data allow to allow me to do certain functions like flip the drone or make it just go up and down really fast. Uh, yes. Is this detects how much it clinches? Um, the question was, what what API feature? That's what you said, right? Um, it's, it's something I had to program. This is manual. I'll put the code online so people can see it. I believe I had to write that code from scratch. There's something on there. I think I had to give it a certain percentage on based on like how you take, yeah. I forgot, it's it's in my code. I'll look at it again. I'll let you know. Yeah. What other uh, events can the headset detect? Like um, wink besides winks and teeth? When it was Clenching teeth, one was winking your eye, and there was something else. I have to, yeah, I have to get back to you on that. Yes. Whatever eye you want to use. If it winks your eye. Uh, can you no. do separate actions when you wink your left eye versus your right eye? I'm trying to remember the SDK. Hold on. Believe I you I believe it's only the right eye. I believe it's only the right eye. So I'll get back to you on that. So is this uh, this project is uh, open source on your GitHub account, is that right? Yeah, I'm put it online today. Okay, great. It was really buggy, so I have to document it and I didn't write any test code for any people who like love doing tests for all of their code. I'm sorry, but uh I'll document it and let everyone know what I did. 
No, no, that's great. A are there any other questions while we have Andre up here? No. Any young ones? No. All right. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for hanging in there. That was <laughs> thank you. very nice. Okay, so that is all we have right now for tonight. Uh, before we sort of make our way down to the bar, I'm going to go ahead and put uh, directions up here for folks to look at. But before we head out, does anyone else have any uh, parting thoughts, wisdom? If not, thank you to Sam and Paul and Taras and Andre and Isaac. All right, so please come out to the Crooked Knife, and thanks, guys.